Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I really appreciate all the help and support, and Josh and Lester and the rest of the team have done an amazing job bringing everybody together. Um, so, thank you. My name is Shane Kehoe. I'm one of the co-founders of SVK Crypto. SVK Crypto is a venture capital fund based here in London. We deploy capital into crypto and blockchain. We're super early stages. We take equity stakes, but we're actually all about the community. For us, it's not just about writing a check. Anybody has money or capital. It's about building a community and a community that will then, of course, help with adoption. Our most recent milestone is that we have been backed by Block One, the creators of EOS.io. We now have a fund called Cryptogon EOS. Uh, AUM is $50 million, and we're passionate to the core about what we do. We know that the writing's on the wall, and we're just super excited about what the next 10-year view has to play out. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, thanks very much. So um, I thought that today we'd take advantage of the, the intimate setting, uh, I guess, that our hosts at Hobie have created for us, and, uh, and hopefully even take the gloves off a little bit in terms of being as candid as possible uh, about what this year has held and what you guys are um, hoping to, to see in the year ahead. Um, I thought I'd start actually with kind of the investors amongst you and um, just looking at market action. You know, how would you summarize how this year has been uh, in terms of market performance uh, and uh, where you anticipate you know, the, the next few months are going to look like and what's it, what it's meant for your firms, especially as investors, and how you've adapted to it? I suppose I could put to you that one, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think most people, most people experience that it's been um, a brutal year for, uh, for most businesses in the, in the community. Um, what has been particular about the last 12, 13, 14 months is that it's been a specifically retail um, experience. It's been retail investors leading us up the hill and then back down again over the course of this year. And it's the first that we can see it's the first major investment paradigm where that has been the case, where retail has led institutional investors in. So, of course, the price action has been painful, and everybody trying to run a business in this environment is experiencing that. There are no two ways about it. But we see, actually, that there are three main reasons to be you know, continuously bullish about this. Uh, not least that the institutional herd is very much coming to the space. Uh, and we see that being driven by the main macroeconomic drivers of the, of the global cycle. And I'd, I'd love to go into that as we talk about 2019. Uh, so taking the, the market dynamics aside then, let's look at, under the hood a little bit about as how the industry looks. Uh, the way we like to think about our exposure you know, is the market itself, but it's also around themes around custody, around regulation, around broader banking concerns, for example. Um, I suppose starting with you, Simon, you know, how would you summarize regulation today, the progress that's been made this year? Um, and then following on from that, we can go into what the hopes are for 19 as well. How would I summarize it? That's a, a difficult one to do in two minutes, but uh, you see different approaches emerging globally. And I think that's part of the challenge for any business in that it's hard to get any regulatory certainty, uh, and especially in tier one jurisdictions. Uh, of course, you've seen uh, China ha has an approach which is you know, uh, not allowing crypto to touch um, the uh, fiat side as easily. Um, you've seen Japan with a whitelisting model. You see across uh, Europe a more of a wait and see approach. You see in some of the minor jurisdictions uh, more of a let's legislate uh, approach. But if you look at the Gibraltar and the Maltese legislation, it, it's not a low bar. This isn't, a, yeah, I think the fear was with a lot of those jurisdictions that they'd create uh, a set of regulations that were a race to the bottom. If you read those regulations, that's absolutely not the case. Um, and then in, in the US, you've got what the US always does, which is a million agencies doing a million different things uh, and a million bodies trying to then actively lobby those to do something sensible. But in, in spite of itself, it does actually appear to be creating regulatory certainty. Uh, the challenge then becomes, so what does that mean if the institutions are to come in? Because that regulatory uncertainty is the one thing an institution hates uh, and can't touch. 
there's very few parts of the world that you can draw a line around and say, this is the certainty that I need, this is the certainty I need to operate. Uh, and from uh, so when I speak to tier one banks or when I speak to the global regulators, there's, there's, there's several layers of challenges, right? You've got the, the global standards bodies, your FATFs and your central banks who have a very clear view that the technology and the assets themselves could be enormously beneficial to the global economy. From creating truly global finance to transparency in finance, there's a whole bunch of things that they actually really, really like. You've got the next layer down, which is some of the regions, and that's kind of affected by politics to a certain degree. Um, and policy is leading regulation more than regulation is leading policy. And the reality is, so I was on a panel with uh, the head of policy from Europol and uh, the guy who leads policy for FATF a couple of weeks ago down at the Thomson Reuters building. And they were saying, we're seeing more illicit activity in crypto than we were a year ago, and that is increasing. And so the real challenge this space has is got is in terms of credibility and in terms of regulatory certainty. And the only way we're going to be able to create those is going to be with hard work. But I don't know that the war chest is really there that it was 12 months ago to do those hard yards, which is one of the reasons I wanted to kind of help get the industry together under global digital finance, because I think that's going to be the most important thing to unlocking that institutional capital. That and, of course, as you mentioned, some of the infrastructure things like custody and merchant banks. And um, I suppose so going into uh, the, 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 the custody side, the, the, the banking side, and are there those kind of operating concerns that the, the companies, the industry are, are faced with? Um, I, was, I was going to point this at, uh, at Bob and, and Shane here. Uh, what has been your experience? What has been your main kind of friction points as operators this year uh, that you're, you're hoping to solve for? Yeah, I think to build on, on Simon's point, what we have seen is basically projects, they are arbitraging the geography space in terms of where they will actually set up, uh, where they will put an entity in terms of the legal as well as the people, and they don't mind moving people around. At least that's what we have seen both within Europe as well as Asia. And I think as we sort of progress and mature in the space, both on the what I would call the utility as well as the security token, I'm wondering what that brings. Because uh, if you basically set up in a jurisdiction no one ever heard of, and I'm talking, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Malta or Gibraltar, I'm talking about some islands that no one ever heard of, and you have a securities uh, sort of issuance there, um, I, I'm wondering you know, how much protection is there, actually. And uh, so I'm not, not necessarily, you know, um, maybe as, as bullish as, as maybe some of the other people on going, going forward. Um, to your question in terms of the, the operating banking, etc., I think banking accounts are a big issue for a lot of projects, for a lot of startups, uh, regardless of where they, where they are incorporated, because the moment it's a script on the application, the, the, the accounts just won't get, won't get open. Um, I think some of the statistics that we heard in, in Switzerland, I think there's maybe 80 projects um, that have bank account out of like 500. And obviously that's, that's, uh, that's a challenge. Um, so yeah, very sort of um, very tough environment despite sort of the obvious growth and a lot of the jurisdictions may be opening. So, but can you, can you narrow it down then? Because is there therefore uh, a set of jurisdictions that you think have got their act together uh, and are are the right environments for, for crypto companies to actually be focused on? I think every jurisdiction at this point still comes with a few sort of issues. For example, Malta. A lot of people talk about Malta. I think they're doing a lot of good things, but it's part of the European Union, and hence whatever they're, they're proposed might not actually happen you know, in a few years or might not be sort of acknowledged in a few years' time. Um, I think similar Gibraltar actually is not in the European Union, and there are sort of issues around that. So I don't have a jurisdiction where I would people point to. I think what is good is see what sectors you are, where the other companies in that sector incorporate it, because there might be some precedents that you can use. Let's just park the jurisdictions for one second, because that bores me. It probably bores a lot of people in this room. Let's go back to Steve. You, you didn't really fully trash out your point on, on price. The way I look at this is it's binary, right? So talking about jurisdictions, if this market goes to zero, is pointless. Talking about jurisdictions, if the market goes to 10 trillion, 100 trillion dollars, it's, it's an advantage. But guess what? All those jurisdictions, when they find out there's money in it, like Switzerland, Malta, Gibraltar, they'll figure it all out. So let's leave those guys to the side for a second. Let's talk about what's much more interesting. It's a binary market, okay? We got a 10-year view. This is already gonna go to zero, and all of us were on some great experiment, and it was wonderful to meet you all, but we're all gonna have to go get real jobs. That disappoints me. It disappoints me to the fact of unhealthiness. So, 
let's break it down like this. Two sides of the story. Price action. Price action, what everyone's talking about. $125 billion market cap. Bitcoin cash down 9%, EOS down 12%. Everyone gets really disheartened about the price action. The price action is actually not important. It's not the metrics that we should be evaluating this market. It's all about the underlying tech. It's about the build out. And the price action is not important because it's driven by sentiment. And sentiment is driven by fear and greed. It's emotion. Having been a trader in the market before I set up SVK Crypto, I worked for one of the largest hedge funds here in London. I was a portfolio manager and a partner of Bluecrest Capital Management. I ran equity capital markets. I know what a down market's like. I know what a bull market's like. I know how to put on risk. I know how to rebalance my portfolio. I understand that market impeccably well. But we have price to earnings in DCFs and various different models that we can plug in to get valuations. In this market, we don't have any DCFs. We have no valuations. We certainly don't have a thing called revenue or earnings or profit. But what we do have is we have a vision, and a vision of how it should be. And the only way to really buy into that vision is to look at the tech that's being built out. So that's, I think that's a great segue into speaking about the future now. Uh, looking at 2019 and, and focusing on this innovation point, what's going to come out that actually constitutes tangible progress, and some form of delivery uh, between what the actual project, the, t the, the tenure of is about, and what actually we would like to see in 2019 to actually happen. What do you think that looks like uh, with, with the next year in mind? Well, just to pick you up on this, the way that I can view this is when I look back at the dot-com. When you look at the likes of Amazon from its initial IPO price to its profits warning, that fell 98%. JDS Unifé is the same, 97%. There's a lot of tech companies which also fell to that, that regard. When you also look back at the technology space in the late 90s, Combined market cap was about 6.7 trillion. Uh, NAS, NAS, market cap of technology companies listed on the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. We're nowhere near that. We're still pre-Netscape. We still haven't even figured out what we are going to do with these products. So it's super, super, super early. Oh, yeah, I think the, the analogy with Amazon, I always find it to be kind of quite convenient, kind of survivorship bias in a way. You know, we look at this is what happened to yeah, Amazon back in the day, and look at where it's at today. I think like what you also got to consider looking at the next 12 months is what is the actual the landscape of current operators is going to look like, and you know, drawing on that analogy, you know, how many I guess bodies are going to be left on the floor uh, if, if, if conditions don't improve. I'll tell you what, there was 902 ICOs in 2017. At the end of the year, 42% of those 902 ICOs was trading below issue or had no liquidity. Um, about a month ago, that was tracking towards 98%, and I guarantee you it's going to 99.9% .9 recurring. Because all these projects raised money and they couldn't execute. They couldn't execute because they didn't have scale, they didn't have a roadmap, they didn't have a plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So when you're looking at a 12-month plan, we could, probably, we could probably go a lot lower than this. But that's okay, that's only the price action. You've got to believe, you've got to ask yourself, do you believe in the fundamentals? Have the fundamentals changed? If they haven't, then turn off the screen. Simon, Keep building. You're, you're, yeah, you're, don't I, I jump in. A16Z for some time have been talking about new types of fundamentals and new types of yes. cooperatives and new types of way of, um, and, and the, the, the old fat coat protocols thesis and the sound money thesis. You hear lots of people throwing around what the new fundamentals are. And whenever I hear people talking about new fundamentals, I get really concerned because whilst the way we value those networks may change, I don't know that fundamentals ever to change. Uh, it, I hate to be one of those like Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, it's hustle time bro type dudes because I, I hate that stuff I hate hustle porn like I'm not a fan tell of it tell me what you love tell me what you love don't tell me what you hate tell me what you love come on let's go but I love fundamentals. I love Great. revenue. I love people who actually build something that has value to somebody who is going to buy that thing. And frankly, most crypto networks don't. They had something that they made up and they pumped it and they dumped it. And I think what happened is that was the speculative bubble. And until that fundamental starts to come in, we're in real trouble. And we will continue to be in real trouble. And I don't know, and what I can't see, and I don't know if you guys do, and I don't mean to play moderator role, but I don't see where that starts to come from. I think it's adoption, right? I think it's something using something, irrespective of if it's for a price or a cost or a fee, it's you have to have something that's at least used. If you have built something and it doesn't have any usability, then it's, it's useless to everybody apart from the person who built it as a vanity platform. And DAP usage is like single-figure thousands, right, across all of the DAP platforms. Well, 
And that's exactly why I think that the comparison to, to Amazon and to the dot-com bubble is flawed. Because back then, some of these businesses, they at least had some revenue. They had some business model. They had yeah. a few customers. Yeah. And yeah. nowadays, you, had, you came up with a white paper. You came up with a white paper. I went, I went to Goldman Sachs, and they were, they were viewing and valuing businesses on eyeballs. I was there in 1999 in Fleet Street. They didn't have revenues. Perfect. Even eyeballs. Nowadays, you don't even have these eyeballs, right? <laughs> exactly. So you have white paper. You came up, the, the projects, they come up with something. And it's not even used. Show me a user metric. Show me you like yes, it, exactly. that's the thing. Show me usage because uh, you can be pre-revenue with great usage. Like you can have a uh, hundred million users and no revenue, and I know you could monetize that for something. So I feel I feel like you guys are are quite optimistic about the tenure of you, but very harsh about the two of you at the same time, which to me strikes me as a slight contradiction. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, um, th there is bound to be you know stuff that we know in the market today that we think is going to deliver either uh, a better environment, I guess, for some of the in in investment inflows, or a uh, more adequate investment products. Got to at least keep things ticking as we're all invested in the kind of tenure optionality. That is the value creation. So look, thinking about that for a minute, um, I'd quite like actually you to jump in and tell us a bit more about what you see from a, let's, the, the, the kind of the, the, the invest, uh, sorry, the institutional investor involvement in this. Um, and if you guys could actually talk about maybe some of the way in which the market is maturing from an investment product standpoint, that'd be quite interesting, because I think we're not touching on you know, what's being done about volatility, but potentially the stable coin market, those types of things. Do they constitute something that's actually going to keep things ticking whilst people are working hard at delivering on that value? Sure. Um, let me just sort of chip in here. So I applaud Shane for his view, and I share his view 100% where this place is going to be in 10 years. Um, as anyone who has run their own business, or as every portfolio manager also knows, the 10-year the vision is the easy bit. It's actually managing the risk. And you know, talking about options, this is very much a path-dependent option on where the space and the participants in this community find themselves. Because for, for the likes of Galaxy or Huobi, we're, we're big, you know, well, uh, finance companies um, that have got permanent capital that, are, that can stay here. But as we all appreciate in any marketplace, um, you don't have a market without multiple participants, without multiple counterparties. And so I rather choose to hear the question about, you know, what, what does this space look like in the next three, six, nine, 12 months? Because I think that is where, uh, I think that's the empathy and that is the relevance to probably most people with small to mid-sized companies in this space. So to that point, where I see the great message of hope is just the institutional adoption is happening right here, right now. And for me, what we saw in September, early October, we saw um, some of the big investment banks. We saw Morgan Stanley, we saw Citigroup, we saw Goldman Sachs reaffirm their intentions in the space. And you know what, that's great. I'm really pleased to see them do that. So we, I don't buy that. <laughs> I don't buy that they're coming. The, this, the institutions are coming is a great story, but I can introduce you to some people who are on the inside who, will, who were and have now left, and will say, yeah, that's all bullshit, right? It, so a lot of it's optics, a lot of it's PR, a lot of it's wanting to seem real, and you get the meeting and you go into the room and it seems great. I've been on the side of a bank and I've been in the room when somebody's gone out of that room and said, Barclays is going to do a thing with us. And I'm like, mm. no, we're not. We just said hello because I'm, we were curious about who you were. I'm always a bit cautious about using the banks as, as, as the best analogy, though, because, because to Simon's point, they're kind of also almost the last entrance mm -hmm. in a cycle of innovation. It's the exact I, same I think, when I they think, hire. They always hire when the market's at I, the very I, I point, think, and they always fire at the very lows. So they yeah. always get it wrong. They're topped and tailed continuously. So, I, I hear the dynamic that, you know what, investment banks are really big, complicated, sophisticated organizations. And invariably, there is a bid offer range of views, range of dynamics, range of personal incentives. And the typical investment banking model, if you go, and they're all pretty much the same, where the capital markets, desk heads, and the senior management regime are still very much understandably smarting from 10 years post GFC of all the fines, particularly on the KYC AML front. So understandably, they're a little bit less excited. 
Whereas on the private banking side, they're all, let's get in because their clients have very real demand. So, Steve, so what, nothing is simple, but the investment banks, to your point, are but one, and I think the least important of the institutional drivers. The right. most important thing that has happened in the last three months from the institutional point of view is the advent of David Svensson and the Yale, the US endowments, who remember are the pinnacle of the biggest investment momentum drive there has been since the GFC, which is the move from the bond market into multi-asset investments. Be right? Before you start to see- That's the game here. I, I totally agree with you on that, Steve. It's a very, very good point. I think before you start to see real institutional capital move in, you have to have the custody solution set up. And I mean locked down to a point where the auditors can audit, okay? You need to also have products which the institutionals are used to having, all different types of hedging facilities, um, all different types of products where they can go long and short and they can manage risk. They also need all the tools to do it, the institutional tools to do it. They need the counterparties to deal with. They're not going to necessarily deal with the, an exchange and unregulated in a different part of the world. Is that when you have a market of $125 billion, it sounds like a lot. Guess what? It's not. The market is so small for real institutions to really move in here. And I'm talking to Teplins, the Black Rocks, uh, the, the More Caps, the Brevin Howards, the Oxifs, so real institutional money which want to put risk on. This market at this point in time, at this level, just the price point, is also just one thing to be a little bit concerned about. Yeah. So let's drill into the kind of some of the specifics of what you described here and like how, how you see those things pan out next year. So, you know, taking custody uh, and taking, well, starting with custody actually, because I think. Uh, as a firm on our side, it's something that's very close to our centre of interest, and it's we, we're still reeling to kind of find actually uh, something that's be delivered in the market that feels scalable and that's going to actually meet institutional investor expectations. But what, what's your view on this? Like, there's there's this, this custody aspect, then there's auditors being on board. Um, do you anticipate that 2019 is going to be the year for those structural pieces to come into play? Um, and I quite like. Uh, you know, Simon, to finish off with what, how, how you think regulation is also going to evolve in that broader context over the next year. Bob, you want to take that <laughs> Yeah, so I think we kind of already spoke basically about the answer, right? I think the, this will definitely, a lot of these things will happen. The, the custody, I think there's a, a number of custody solutions that are basically being used by a number of institutions that I think will just advance. There will be much better sort of, if you want, interfaces for auditors, et cetera, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. I think that what will happen is that also the prices of these solutions will go down in terms of the service, because currently it's quite expensive, most of them. Um, so I'm quite, quite, quite sort of, you know, positive on that front. I think in terms of the new products, um, especially exchange, exchange trading products, I think there's a couple of uh, ETN notes uh, that, uh, that you can buy that hopefully or, or are quite close to copying the, the, the price of, um, of the underlying, I think again we will see quite a bit of uh, flourishing in terms of you know going also into other, especially EOS for example. Uh, there are some some movements there where there will be an ETN etc. So I think again quite quite positive. Um, where I think a lot of people are looking at is obviously the STO trend and uh, a lot of the a lot of the sort of um, securities basically uh, because until now ICOs basically were non dilutive to the to the investors or to the, to the to the project owners basically I think obviously that is a big trend uh, personally I'm quite skeptical on that um, I think that will, will has a lot of issues around it and then we can elaborate on that when when, when you want I, I'd love for you guys to expand on this uh, the kind of skepticism actually that that rightly or wrongly some people are holding in, in relation to STOs so that um, I, I suppose that yeah, please expand. Uh, it's, it's, it's the core of many of the debates that we're seeing around how new businesses who are entering the space should consider, uh, consider funding themselves. Uh, to my understanding, there's very limited opportunities for these uh, tokens to then be traded. Uh, there's very few venues on which the, the liquidity can actually uh, scale. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yes, I think... Basically, the, and I think a lot of people here are probably familiar with, with STOs. Um, I think the, the, the issue there is that a lot of people think this is an easy way to finance and to fundraise. I, I don't believe so because it's regulated, it's securities, it has the name in itself, right? So you need to have a, you need to be quite regulated when you make this process of fundraising. And a lot of people think of it as a way to basically make a lot of um, private capital much more liquid. 
uh, and uh, basically fundraise much more easily. So on the fundraising side, I think, you know, obviously KYC applies here as well, and uh, there will be a lot of restrictions, so you can't just suddenly go and fundraise from whoever you want, even if they would actually give you the money. Similar for marketing of these securities, there's a lot of rules around it, uh, especially obviously in the US, but even in Europe. So um, there will be a lot of barriers to actually go and market these securities. And then on the trading side, I think similar similar issues apply. What do you see currently in the in the equity space? Sorry, in the apologies in the in the ICO space, a lot of these tokens are actually not liquid. There's very very limited uh, trading volume. Um, we we do um, work with around 40 projects currently for designated market making where we provide a liquidity. Something similar will need to happen also in um, in the um, in the STO space. Otherwise, you just have a price that is maybe a couple of weeks old. And uh, I guess uh, that's for uh, for Simon. I mean, once you start introducing the the burden of kind of securities law uh, around um, STOs and what that represents for issuers, are we still is does it still constitute real value creation for the stakeholders there, or are we just basically reverting to the old systems which this, this entire industry it, it depends who meant for. to innovate against. It depends who for, right? And it depends what your thesis is. Like, it, is crypto there to um, build a new world order, in which case security tokens, maybe they don't get you what you want. Is crypto there to make finance more transparent and more efficient and fair? Then actually security tokens could be pretty fucking cool. Um, so. I, I err on, on that side um, a little bit. Um, I, I, what I didn't like about ICOs was the instant liquidity. Um, I thought that was ripe for abuse. I think there's nothing wrong with instant liquidity for certain types of asset classes on, uh, done in certain types of conditions, but I think there is a massive amount of risk there and there was nothing done. I could just take a, a, you know, 20 lines of ERC-20 code and hey presto, I could raise money from anyone in the world. That's a, that's a bullet in a gun, that's dangerous. Uh, so we do need to think about ways in which you can have a collective responsibility around this. And I'd like to see solutions that didn't involve lots of compliance people doing lots of manual checks. And security tokens potentially offer us a way to, a path to that, but the way they're being built now, it, it might as well just be issuing a shared certificate. And you might as well yeah. be issuing a traditional Correct. security. Sorry. Uh, no, I, I totally agree with what you're talking about, a share certificate if it's backed by any, any type of ownership in the business or any type of equity, it's just a share. Um, I think the ICO market and the STO market, um, one, you know, wonderful in theory, uh, it's amazing that we can break down the walls of venture capital and we can have a long tail of, of investors from all around the world with all different backgrounds, all adding to a pool of capital for a project or a fund, and I'm all about that. However, you've just kind of mentioned with regards to uh, taking a view as an investment. Um, we at SVK and me personally, when I look to invest into something, um, I'm, I'm quite basic about it. It's like, I'm giving you my hard-earned money. What are you going to do with it and how are you going to get me a return? How are you going to get me a return? How am I going to generate returns for my clients? Show me how you are going to grow my money. And it's very, very basic. And as soon as someone can't answer that question, it's a, just a no. I walk right out. And, and when you get a satisfactory answer to that question, do you become structure agnostic then? You would be equally happy. Oh, no. Then I ask another question and another question. I just keep on going. <laughs> I mean, I just wear the guy out. I want to know absolutely everything to the deepest, darkest level. I want to know what the guy had for breakfast and who he was with last night. I'm not joking you. I'm serious about this. I'm giving my money to someone who's given me a token or a piece of paper or some other bullshit. How am I going to generate returns? And where are you going to be? And in theory, transparency about how they're operating their business would Absolutely. be amazing. But that's a theory, it's not practice. And yeah. security tokens as they're being offered today don't live up to that. And that's what frustrates me as somebody who sees those as actually being a, a potentially good answer in the long term. Uh, if you think about it, look, financial market infrastructure is, is woefully inadequate. Both uh, it, it, we replicate and we actually move assets around and in the most just painful way with double entry bot keeping. It, it's agonizingly slow and painful. Like that is ripe for disruption uh, and it's ripe for being built a new way. And I think the answer is somewhere between uh, kind of new technologists with new ideas and people who knew what the old world was and where the bodies are buried, right? And, and I think somewhere in there we see a good answer. But, I, but that will require pushing back on the regulations in the right way. Not putting your middle finger up into them and going, fuck the world, you know, we don't need no stinking central banks. I think it's sort of transitioning from that world to something that's better for everybody. So, so speaking of the regulation and the regulatory response, when, when you're speaking to regulators today, what, what's your sentiment? They look at security tokens as well. It's within securities law, so we'll just basically, we're not, we'd have to rewrite anything to support the growth of that industry? Or are they, are they open to a tailored response um, 
to, 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 what, to what we're trying to achieve here? It depends who you talk to. Um, I, I generally find that uh, the European response is uh, we recognise the opportunity, let's wait and see, and we should avoid passing laws if we can really avoid it. Um, the AMF response in France I thought was particularly encouraging where they see not only benefits, but they saw opportunities to uh, have a uh, hold harmless letter for people that came through their sandbox that issued security tokens in a new way and were being data-driven about how they proved they complied. So they were you were saying, this is how my token's being operated. Here are the wallet addresses that are applying to that, and here's the organization that KYC'd them that you as a regulator can check with, rather than having this paper trail that a human audited on paper and spreadsheets afterwards, which we all know can be forged. This was something that was actually data-driven. The data was shared across a blockchain which multiple people could see. That, to me, is something that regulators see massive benefit in. So you could bring these pockets of light, um, but then also you've got to deal with the fact that there are massive amounts of market abuse still happening and market manipulation still happening, that the increase in criminal activity is consistent. So they're in this position where they're like, yeah, I get that there's benefits here. I completely intellectually understand what you're saying, but also help me solve that first, and then we can get to the to your dream future. So they've got a prioritization issue because their paymasters are breathing down their neck saying, stop the state-sponsored hackers from hacking into me, please. Fair enough. And so speaking of um, market activity, um, one of the things you guys have pointed out is the fact that at this, at this juncture, you know, 120 billion market cap industry, limited liquidity. Uh, as I suppose I was thinking about, about, about your firm specifically, are you guys structuring solutions that are actually going to add to the liquidity solutions in the market? Um, I'm thinking about you know, leverage, about credit, and all those things. How do you think that pans out? I suppose introducing leverage into the market in that form this early into the maturity of the industry, I suppose. Yeah, let's put some petrol on the bonfire, shall we do that? Let's just, let's just do 100 times leverage or 1,000 times leverage on one of the other exchanges. The uh, volatility that goes on intraday is more than a year's volatility in the FTSE 100. This market well, is I mean, already so batshit less crazy. The equity market, so you know it does fluctuate. But that's, that's your point. But there is there's ways in which volatility can be addressed. I suppose there's instruments that are tailored to that today. Um, I'm thinking specifically about stable coins. I think that the derivatives market is generating uh, uh, solutions as well, which allows for some of the hedging of that volatility. Uh, and I, I was actually quite keen on letting you speak for a minute. Sure. All the best so, on credit. I absolutely agree with you. Yes, we are. Galaxy absolutely is at the forefront of developing derivative solutions. Um, as, as Shane well knows, any derivative market has got two types of participant. It has got speculators, and it has got those seeking to hedge out some risk. Um, Shane is absolutely correct in saying that 100 times leverage is wildly inappropriate for anyone with even with any given amount of, of experience managing risk, in, in my honest opinion. And actually, if you look at the global derivative market already, that is, it's the, le it's the access play that is by far the biggest thing, the access for a corporate to, to swap out its variable interest rate for fixed. It's the access to new markets where actually, for whatever regulatory or personal reasons, you cannot access a security. So I think, I think the derivatives are inevitable. Galaxy absolutely is, is part of that. We're excited about that. Um, most of the 17 strong trading team that we have has a lot of experience trading derivatives for, for 10, 20 years. So it's kind of inevitable that that's going to happen. But for me, the, you mentioned stable coins, and that is giving access, not just to individuals or to corporates to speculate or to you know, hedge out a risk. Here you're talking about giving access to, to whole countries, to industry sectors, to, to essentially secure their funding, right? And that, that's massive. That, that is one of the biggest things. So talk to me about derivatives. That's what crosses my mind. Is that going to happen? You bet it's going to happen. Fantastic. Um, I just want to close out with one last question because I feel like I, I did not yet get a specific answer from any of you guys on this. When you think about 19, you're thinking about a specific project, a specific addition to what we know about the current infrastructure or architecture of the overall industry. Is there one thing that you guys are very excited about? Um, I think we're still in the plumbing stage. We're still building that infrastructure, the roads, the rails. 
Um, I know that there are several other protocol levels to come out. Um, Hashgraph, which maybe some of you have invested in at a pretty bullish valuation. I know there's Kadena, which is out of uh, ex JP Morgan and SEC guys, Will, and that team do, a, do an amazing job. And there's several other protocols. I think that's really what I'm interested in, is to see how the future will look. And almost like operating systems are different web browsers, in the future, there'll be protocols which will be free, fast, and scalable, like maybe EOS. There'll be protocols which will be solely private. There'll be protocols for different types of enterprises. And I think I'm, I'm really interested to see the solutions and the, creati the, cre uh, the, the creations that are, are, that are forthcoming in 19 and, and what they can do. And I think we need to have the infrastructure, the plumbing, the pipes, the roads, the rails. And then once that's there, and we already do, to be fair with them, the OSIO protocol, our uh, Stellar, our even Ethereum, although they have had some congestion problems. I'm not going to mention crypto kitties, which after 37,000 transactions in one week brought down the network. But you're allowed to buy whatever you want online. That's not my game. But I think I'm really interested in the protocols. But what I will also say, just coming back on to, to Steve's point, it's amazing just how far we've come in such a short period of time. Remember, at the start of 2017, that wasn't that long ago, the total market capitalization was only $20 billion. There was no bank, hedge fund, trader. Nobody was interested in the space. This was all the guys, the devs, the nerd money, you know, the, the people that had a vision that were buying and selling Bitcoin or using it to transact. It was the core group of the community, the people. By the end of 2017, funny enough, when the market capitalization was 800 billion, it's a 40x return if my maths is about correct, everybody was interested. And a lot of great stuff has been built and a lot of continuous stuff will, will be built, especially on the institutional side. Great. Bob? So, for me, oh. thanks, did you just cut that off? <laughs> <laughs> I can shout, I don't mind. <laughs> For me, and I'll wrap it up, I'm really just excited about where we're going and how we're going to get there. And everyone is along for the ride. And it's just wonderful that we've all come out here today and we're all got a vision and we're all looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, oh, perfect. Thank you. So. I will just pick up exactly on what, what sort of Shane mentioned, right? CryptoKitty. So I think where, what we will see in 2019 is we will see a privacy solution that is scalable, that will attract enterprise. Because I think privacy and scalability is like the combination as well is something that people have actually not cracked yet. And that's what's holding a lot of people, especially on the enterprise level back, to actually adopt these public chains. They can obviously go into some private chains that, you know, look some sort of, you know, some proprietary software, but on the public chain level. So I think that is what I'm excited about. I'm not going to mention actually any projects, unfortunately, but uh, uh, that I think is, is what 2019 holds for us. I hope. Fantastic. That. Um, I, I was chatting to uh, Vitalik yesterday. Um, he, I interviewed him for Blockchain Insider. That episode drops next week. And he said um, that he's really interested in uh, stocks, CK stocks. Um, and, and actually, I think uh, that whole space, getting enterprise, will really start to change the mindset in enterprise. Because crypto networks run parallel to crypto. Right, but what you didn't have is crypto that was true over time. It, it gave you a point in time. I signed this fact to be true uh, in 1993, and I don't know if it's still true. Now, that is hugely, hugely advantageous if I can know that fact is still true in all parts of the economy. And I think the beginnings of people waking up to that, um, you'll see this with various infrastructure upgrades next year. But I think you do see, um, like, we'll get away from those stupid headlines around Maersk pilots a thing with IBM, and we'll start getting into, like, interesting company does something a bit more interesting with crypto, and that will start to come out. And, and that's where it gets interesting. Fantastic. Yeah, right. There are two things I'm excited about. Um, the macroeconomics driving the big institutional investors, investors into the space. And secondly, just that reading the financial press and reading about some exciting company and having to scroll down to find out that they're doing it in blockchain. And that actually, you know, a blockchain is just a part of the real world. And we're actually just unaware of actually these solutions, these real life use cases are happening to be driven by this tech. Steve, we're starting to see that in logistics in ticket sales uh, and in loyalty schemes. There's corporations, which I'm sure we all know, that are already looking at taking a couple of percent of their balance sheet and deploying it into crypto for our, into blockchain technologies for that very reason. Just like when companies went from being a typical company to having a website, we're starting to see that moving and enterprises will drive that because it's good for business, it's good for their, for their particular revenue model 
they can deploy Kaplan and I think once that catches on to the adoption... And there'll be businesses born that do that, that yes. will then compete with them and that's what yes. excites me as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, guys, um, uh, I'd like to thank Huobi, your host today, uh, very much for hosting this event and uh, the panellists. Guys, thanks a lot. Uh, we should do this again next year. Thank you. Thank you.